How's it going, everybody? We are back yet again with another episode of Debate Night. We've got four great analysts today. Got some very fun topics to discuss. Disc golf uh, was back this previous weekend, so we should have a lot of interesting things to talk about. We're going to talk a little bit about AB, a little bit about disc golf betting later in the show. Should be very interesting to see what people think about that. Certainly has been met with a lot of uh, critique online so far. But before we get into any of our topics, let's go ahead and introduce our analysts for today's show. Brody Smith is here as always yeah nice new background trevor liking it liking it um comments were interesting last week it seemed like there were some that were siding with me that were saying hey listen uh i don't want to listen to someone read which i completely agree there were some people saying they were falling asleep which i also was kind of falling asleep so being the man of the people i was just trying to throw it out there And then there were some people that I think misunderstood and being like, no, you need notes for a debate. I'm not saying don't have notes. I'm just saying, don't like write it out and read it word for word. Like I have the worst memory. If I'm trying to, you know, pull some stats and stuff, trust me, I have them written down, but let's just, let's stick to, uh, let's stick to kind of the the general talking and not, I'm trying to like just read an essay off, off your computer is just brutal, man. Okay. There's, We'll see. Uh, we'll see if anybody agrees with that. But yeah, I, I mean, that's that's fair point. That's fair point. Reading verbatim is definitely different than having notes. Uh, Sam is returning today. Thanks for having me back. Appreciate the invite. Fun fact, guys. Sam's sick camera shot. That's just an iMac. They're making cameras just that good iMac. these days. It's incredible. Un- unbelievable. Unbelievable. Wait, what? Uh, yeah, that's just a standard iMac camera. It's not a, a paid iMac. advertisement. Not a paid advertisement. Oh, like uh, that's on, uh, that's, that's on webcam. your, uh, yet your wa- webcam, the webcam. I, yeah. Oh, wow. Crazy. That's, that's very nice. Um, another guy sitting in front of a brick wall today is uh, Gary. Great to be back. Just remember there are three types of people in the world. Those who can count and those who can't. <laughs> what happened? Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> got me for a second. Wait, Wait I, 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 I'm, I'm not... it's way over my head. I don't got it. I don't got it. <laughs> Someone fill me in. I feel like an help idiot. Me, help me, help me, help me, help me. Get in the comments. Let us know if you figured that one out. There you go. Love it. Haha, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally got it, guys. Oh, I got it now. And then uh, Hunter is here as well. <laughs> I will totally not read off of my computer, and I will fly by the seat of my pants to make sure that I can compete with at Brody Smith 21. This is what I'm gonna do. If I'm gonna, That's if good. I lose this week, if I lose this week, I'm going to AI generate the answers to next week's debate <laughs> night, and I'm just gonna read them off. That's what. That's, that's what, what you're gonna do. Yeah, it's yeah, welcome to the club. Guys. Guys. Isn't that what yeah. everybody does? Uh, we've been apparently, doing that. that's what everyone's doing. <laughs> I mean, how you get I, points? Sometimes they can be pretty smart. I think that's how kids are getting degrees this day. Um, all right, we're gonna get into our first topic here. Talk a little Anthony Barella. So. AB, he's continuing to his historic start to the season with yet another win at the Jonesboro Open. Is this the best start to a season ever? And what are your expectations for his season now that he has set the bar so high? Brody, what do you think? Well, I think we saw, we've all seen that stat that's been going around where the, the last time this happened, I believe, was 2019, right? Paul McBeth winning three of the last five. So it's not, it's never been, it's not, it's not something that has never been done before, but now we have to kind of compare and I've been very firm with just where I have seen the game in 2020 and where I've seen the game. Now I was absolutely garbage. And some of you might still say I'm still garbage at disc golf, but I was absolutely garbage at disc golf in 2020. And I was beating people on the pro tour. That doesn't happen anymore. There aren't garbage people on the pro tour. So I think you have to look at it. The tour has changed so much uh, from every year uh, disc golf is, is getting hard. The courses are getting harder, right? They're, they're finding new ways to make it more challenging. We now are getting standardized T pads. That's like a new thing. Uh, baskets are probably coming soon. The depth of the field, which I talked about earlier is getting much, much better. So until I think like disc golf stabilizes and you're like, Oh, there's not that much difference from year to year. We have to assume every year if someone does something that someone did in previous years, it's more impressive because things are changing in that direction, right? We're not playing plumbers anymore. <laughs> okay. All right. So Brody is uh, definitely kind of saying this is, the, so you're saying this is the best season, best start yeah. to season ever. Yeah. I mean, if, if has, has anyone won four of the first five? I don't think so. Under shaking his head. Yes. 
maybe. Um, well, we'll get to that in a bit. Oh, Sam, what are okay. your thoughts? <laughs> well, I don't think anybody's won four of the first five, and I don't think AB has either because he's only won three of the first five, if I'm not mistaken. Um, <laughs> but that's beside the point. Um, is this the best start to disc golf season ever? I have to say no. Um, I think it's it's up there. It's probably tied for the best start to a disc golf season ever. But, I mean, we've seen it before. Paul did this in 2019. That's not that long ago. Yes, the field's a little bit deeper, but it's pretty much still the same game. Like, he's not doing anything too crazy yet. What I want to see is what is AB going to do over the next two or three events? Where is he going to place in those? Is he going to continue his dominance, or is he going to fall off a little bit? Paul, in 2019, not only won three out of the first five, but of the eight events, eight events that were labeled as Disc Golf Pro Tour events in 2019, Paul won six out of the eight. I want to see where Anthony Barella stacks up through eight events. If he, if he gets to five or six out of the first eight in this field, yeah, it's the best start to the season ever. But I don't think we're there yet. I don't think we can quite judge it yet. Um, I want to see I want to see how it plays out a little bit further. You know, there's still 17 events left in the season. I want to see we're not uh, five events in is not as far in as it used to be because there's more events. So I think we need to let it play out and see what it has. As far as expectations, I just hope he keeps playing well. You know, everybody wants to see him succeed. I, I think he can do it. And I hope he has the season that everybody wanted Calvin to have last year. Sam, yeah. that was the question. What do you mean? I'll hold my rebuttal. Save your rebuttal. Gary, what are your thoughts? I'll hold my rebuttal. Yeah, I'm going to have to disagree. I mean, we're talking about just through the first five events. So I'm going to have to disagree with Sam here that we're not waiting. We're talking about just a start. It's hard to argue against this start as not being the best we've seen. Statistically, it's got to be one of the best starts we've ever seen. If you look at the stats compared to the field, you know he's the first in average birdies per round, the second in lowest bogeys per round, first in park percentage, second in C1 in regulation, first in C2 in regulation, third in fairways hit, and first in strokes to gain T to green. And he's leading that one by a landslide. There are some other things to consider. Like Brody said, the strength of the field, it's completely different. Despite that strength of the field, AB has shown that he can lead from the front. I mean, look at chess.com. He fended off a surging Ricky Wysocki. He fell apart a little bit on hole 17, but he clutched up on 18 and took it to the end. At Texas States, he led after all three rounds. So he showed us, I can lead from the front. And then he showed us at Jonesboro, despite having a slow start, that final round, he was even par through 13 holes. He said, I can come back and I can do this. There was a singular moment there that shifted everything for him. It was that eagle putt from inside 60 feet on hole 14. That burst of emotion as he ran to the basket. I mean, Nate said on commentary, I think the person who's going to hit the eagle on this hole is going to win. And guess what? It actually happened. Going forward, I think there are a bunch of events that play really well for AB. And I think even the ones that don't are still attainable for him. Personally, for me, I think this year we see AB's first major win and maybe another one to two or three wins on tour. As AB said himself after the fact in an interview, he's just cruising now. Mm. Mm -hmm. Music to my ears. Um, all right, Hunter, wrap it up for us. What are you thinking so far? Uh, yeah, so the greatest start, if you just want to go pure statistics and don't factor strength of field in, is Macbeth 2015. He started off, we're just using majors and NTs, but it gets even crazier if you didn't. But first at a major, second at an NT, first at an NT, first at an NT, first at an NT. That's the four out of five that's happened before. Uh, Macbeth went on to not finish outside the top three for that entire 2015 season. That's nine years ago. Okay, so if you factor strength of field in, this is the greatest start of a season. Um, I did want to bring up this PDGA stats tweet to farther back that up. All five MPO Elite Series events this season have been decided by one stroke. The previous record uh, was three back in 2020. Um, so this is all neck and neck. Before 2015, 2019, even 2018, 2017, 20, all of those years where you saw dominance, you saw greatness from Macbeth and Ricky. When they won, a lot of times, gosh darn it, they won. They won by a lot. Like the 2015 final nine worlds was a victory lap for Paul. And that was not that uncommon. That is not happening anymore. So looking at the second part of this question, expectations, there's no way he keeps up this pace. Let's just be realistic. I just said all five have been decided by one stroke that if that Eagle putt hits low, we're in a completely different ball game now, right? Like that's we're we're dealing with inches here. Uh, I think he has a chance at music city. I think he struggles at champions cup. He went nine over at Northwood during last year's Ledgestone. There's definitely more events he could get in contention at, especially once we get kind of the West coast and some down the stretch like USDGC, but it'll be interesting to see what happens once he loses momentum. I think he ends the season with five wins total.
That's a good point, Hunt, Momentum. because the, uh, yeah, well, it in wonder there. how Brody feels about it, but it is true. Like when a guy starts the season and is winning like every other weekend, and then all of a sudden maybe they go five events and don't win. What does that do to them? You know, does that kind of creep in a little bit? Who knows? Um, Brody Joseph, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sam, I don't know if you were reading or not. You definitely were not listening when I was saying, cause I feel like everything you said was just like, acted like what I said just didn't matter at all saying, saying that the field is the same in 2019 to now. I, I, just, I was like, I know it's not cause I played in 2020 and I playing now and I, I I'm at the bottom of the leaderboard both those years. And I can see the different l- level of play. Um, but I just went and looked at worlds back in 2019, which we're not even going that far back. We're just going to 2019 and worlds. Now here are some people cause Looking at this list, all these guys are still playing to this day. 2019, you still have Paul, Ricky, Conrad, Emerson, Keith, Chris Dickerson, Sexton, Kevin Jones, Eagle, Simon, Nico, all those guys, Eric Oakley. That's your top 10 back in 2019. All those guys are still playing. You know who wasn't in the top 10 or top 20 back in 2019? Uh, AB, uh, Isaac Robinson, uh, Calvin Heimberg, Gannon Burr, Alden Harris, Kyle Klein. James Proctor, all those people I list this listed were in the top 10. So you're not having like, Oh wait, Oh, all these people that are really good at 2019. They're not playing anymore. They're still playing. And there are even better people playing now to win. Now is way harder. You can't say it's not also what wasn't happening in 2019. You didn't have a bunch of European people coming over playing events. They maybe came over and played a major, maybe, but we are seeing the top players in the world playing almost every week. Now it is not easy to win out there. The point of my argument was not that the field is exactly the same as it used to be. I could, I could poke holes in your argument about, you know, certain players being in the top 10 versus not being now players get worse over time. It's it's part of the, every sport. It's true. One player that's dominant in 2019 is not obviously going to be dominant in 2024. That's just not how sports work. People age, people get better, people get worse. All the people I just listed, though, for the most part, are all really good. Didn't name a lot of old guys, though. Yeah. They're all still good. Uh, Nobody's arguing that they're bad. I just say are bad. I would would agree with Sam that there is players you just named on a list that have declined. Nate Sexton? No! He just doesn't play that often. Uh, he, yeah, Nate Sexton, which means that he got worse. <laughs> Nate, <laughs> yes. Sexton, Nate Sexton was like a shoe in for top six every time he showed up. That doesn't mean he got worse. No, no, stop. What yeah. you guys are saying is different. Nate Getting Sexton top- is a worse no, disc golfer today no, than he was back stop, then. I will, stop, I will stand on stop, that. Stop. What you're saying by saying he was a shoe in for top ten doesn't mean I that agree. he got that. That's I not agree. a good argument that's, to say yeah, that he got worse. Point. If Nate you go Sexton to a bunch of C tiers and get destroying Nate Sexton today. I'll, yeah, I, would, I'll I, I don't that. think that it's the place that matters. I do think that he was a better disc golfer than though. Like, I think there are guys on you that watch list his game that were better. I, I, I once again, I will say that I think that yes, this field is obviously much stronger now, but a lot of those guys you listed, I think have gotten worse. Can, can I just say, can I just give you some stats real quick? Sorry. Just going back. I, I will say last year, he did have an off year. I will say that I looked at last year. He did have an off, off year. 2022, he finished 21st at DDO, 11th at OTB, 10th at Portland Open, 9th at Worlds, 10th at USDGC. Mm-hmm. That that's a that he's bad. Two years ago, two no years one said ago. he was bad. We <laughs> said he's worse than 2019. And that was my argument. Freddie, are you having a worse season this season than than, than last season? Yes. And there you have it. Players can get worse in, in one year. Uh, mm, ah! No. <laughs> I've gotten a heck of a lot worse since 2019. I can tell yeah. you that much. What you guys are saying right now, what you guys are saying is ridiculous. I agreed with your argument. You're, what no, you're I saying, sided with you. There are so many better people playing yeah, to where no, no, now. No, yeah. I, if I Nate agree with that. Mixes, misses and a couple punch, that. he doesn't finish in the top 10. I do he think finishes the outside, much, the, uh, outside the top 30. I do think the field is much, much better. I feel it can be deeper and players can get worse. Yeah. I think it's because the. The finish, the, the compression of the finishes are also different. You know, you, you're not having players win by tons and tons and tons anymore. We just talked about how that's, you know, one stroke. So the, the, the margin for error is just going smaller and that's smaller true. and also, smaller. The difference, between first, different now the that it difference did. between first and 10th at Worlds in 2019 was 20 shots. 
The difference between first and 10th at Worlds in 2023 was uh, seven shots. What are we talking about? I feel like I'm talking to a bunch of crazy people. So you, you don't think and you're, players... And you're, I, know, I, want to ask you, I want to ask you a question, Brody. I want to ask you one question. Yes. So has Tiger Woods gotten worse at golf? Yes, he had surgery, major what, surgery. surgery. Okay, what about uh, what, what the about, heck is wrong with you? What about I mean, name any he's other also player? He's forty plus years old. Is Hunter, Arnold Palm? We, he's dead. We're he's talking. Dead. All <laughs> <those> people, <laughs> Hunter, is, is, Hunter, all the people get it worse. It's the only point I'm trying to make. All the people I just talked about are not forty, Hunter. Your argument is so stupid. That's not. That's not. That doesn't matter. So you, yeah, a, that was age. Nate Sexton stopped touring and was a dad. He probably isn't practicing that much. So that makes he's, he's probably worse, worse at disc golf. So he has gotten worse. There's no you point to this the argument one because guy. it wasn't the key the, point of my argument the in the first place. You picked one guy that isn't really trying to be a professional disc golfer I didn't anymore. pick Nate Sexton. You did. Ricky Weissdahl, he's worse. You're screaming to scream. No, I don't point. think Ricky's worse. Okay. Eagle? Or, or Emerson Keith? Yeah, James Conrad? James, James Conrad, Conrad won a world championship after... So you're gonna say I he think got he's worse? worse than when he won the world. Yeah, I think he's gotten a little worse. You guys are saying he's worse. And the thing is, is like if you really actually look at how they're playing, they're not playing worse. It's just there are more people in the field that but now that's not bump true you for down. Everyone. I agree with that statement, but that's not yeah, true for I everyone. I think the majority, the majority of people, exist. yes. The majority of people, yes. But some players can get worse. But also people are judged based on their score compared to the field, not just their score compared to past years. Because conditions are different every year. So it's, you're not playing the same game on every course year after year. I, okay. I, I don't, I, what I'm saying is we're listing, we're listing a bunch of people that have not had serious injuries. They're not 40 years old. They're still like, at what time, what, what's your prime in disc golf? Do we think AB is going to start getting bad at 30? You want to make that bet? Brody, getting here's a bad question. has nothing to no, do no, with no, age no. a lot of time. You could just, you could, your putt could get off yeah, and then you could question. stuck for a whole Here, year. Here's another question. You're not putting well. Has, has Paul McBeth gotten worse at disc golf? Is Paul McBeth a worse player today than he was in 2019? I think I would say now, that. I think now, like this year and last year, I think you can look at that because I don't think he's practicing nearly as much as he was. So he's got, he's worse at disc golf than he was. But when he, but when he was starting to lose and people were wondering what was going on, I don't think he had gotten worse. Yeah. No, I'm just saying, I think there was better people around to where if you play bad, if you have a bad day, you don't win a tournament anymore. I agree with that statement, but Paul McBeth today is a worse player than Paul McBeth in 2019. I think that for every player. You're talking about people that are slowly fading out of the sport though. You listed the top 10. Yeah, I mean that's just the people that you look, but I'm just saying, Brody. Yes, like, and I'm saying all the people that are anybody, still, all the people that, are that we're playing, saying, there are 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 better or about the same. Nico, listen, Stott, it's like three of them. Nico, Simon, Eagle, uh, Chris Dickerson, Emerson, Keith, James Conrad, Ricky. I would the people that, that the people that you would say. <laughs> What's that? I would argue that Dickerson maybe he had a bad he had a bad couple he's, seasons. He's, there. He's he just finished nine. This, year. He's this back season he's playing year. well. Man. Last year he See, was like, the worst disc golfer. Yeah, right, you can get good again. I'm saying golf fluctuates. Ricky it's Fowler as, went through that period. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah I, 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 I will. Ricky yeah, Fowler never like got you're worse. Sitting there denying that golfers move. can get better and worse without like some major injury or age involved. Not, it happens. not drastically though, Trevor. Not drastically. I didn't. We never said that. We never said AB can get worse the next week. What are we talking about? If AB doesn't win next week, is he worse at disc golf? Are we saying he got worse at disc golf? No, but if that continues for, you know, a year. a years, we're talking, we literally, we're just talking about like a year. I literally just went back a year and a half. I was even, I only went back less than a year and a half ago. At USDGC and Nate Sexton got a top 10. And you're like, Oh, that's what are we talking about? We're not talking about years. Get out of here. Move on. I'll let the comments throw L's all over the place, but all you right. guys are ridiculous to think. I'll let, the, I'll let it go to the. I'm confident you guys are ridiculous to, to think that I'm the field that. I don't now, care. Yeah. that the field now is is at all somewhat similar. Didn't to say never that. what we said. Didn't not what we that. said at all. I not actually made the exact all. opposite <laughs> argument yeah. in my po- in my point. That was not. You're, was, you're we claiming were, that people are bad, and that's nope. they got bad, never and that's why they're going off. Yes, I said some players have gotten worse, and the field has gotten a lot stronger. Both can be true. Both can be true at the same time. That's what I've said this the players, whole time. The only players that you listed that have gotten worse are those that aren't touring full time anymore. That Again, take, you listed that them. <laughs> what you, that's not a good argument. What are you talk, I'm listing the people in the top players. 10. You gave me players. Next question. This is going nowhere. Right, we'll move on. Because yeah, you're really hard to argue with because you're not actually making good points. <laughs> you're, you're walking in circles. <laughs>
We will move on. We will move on. You can discuss. Damn, listen to the question. Listen to what I say next time. Um, <laughs> no, uh, Harry, I wish you, you had jumped in on my side because you actually were on my side there with your points. That's okay. okay. I understand. Um, we're going <laughs> to move on to the next topic. We're going to talk about, we're just going to talk about a dis, the disc golf course. We're going to move away from the players for a little bit. Uh, yeah, so the discs, watch out, AB, when you're 28, you're going to start getting bad, dude. Watch out, man. <laughs> you might. Disc side of heaven reordered the yeah, course this year, keeping most of the holes uh, intact, but changing when they were played during the round. One of the most glaring changes was the new hole 18, previously hole five. What did you think about this hole being chosen as the 18th? Did you like how it played? And do you think par threes work as the finale of a tournament? Sam, what are your thoughts? I think this is a question that's going to get a lot of mixed opinions and probably a lot of loud voices too. Um, do I like how it played? Yes, of course. I think it was an exciting finish to this tournament. Um, the tournament couldn't have ended too much better with AB throwing inbounds, forcing Calvin to go for it. And then, you know, inevitably Calvin came up short and that kind of put a damper on things. It kind of just cut it off cold, um, which is why I don't think this is the greatest choice for a hole 18. Um, any hole where the tournament can be won or loss off of the tee, um, I don't think is a great hole 18. I want to see a par four or a par five where players are having to play chess with one another. I want to see some gamesmanship. I want to see somebody purposefully throw 20 feet shorter than the other person so that they get to go first or purposefully try to outdrive them, forcing the other person to make a decision. You know, I, I want to see somebody force themselves into the driver's seat, force somebody else into the driver's seat. Because if AB had thrown OB going off the tee first on hole 18, then all, all Calvin has to do is lay up and take his three and just hope that AB doesn't throw a miracle 100-foot shot from the drop zone. Um, and I don't think that's disc golf anybody wants to see. At the end of the day, this hole ended up playing well for this tournament, um, but I think it leaves opportunity for excitement to be lost on in, in a world of disc golf where we need more clippable moments and we need more excitement to draw more eyes to our sport. Okay. Sam wants to see some chess on the 18th. Uh, Gary, what did you think about the change? My initial take on the change was was sadness because I think hole one was such a great starting hole. It was big throw, big throws for players, picturesque. And I think hole 18 was such a memorable finisher. I mean, Brad, the course designer, even said he thinks it was one of the best holes on the tour, but it was impossible to enjoy for spectators. That's why they made the change. But despite that, I think the layout actually played fairly balanced. It was entertaining. The new layout created a lot of uh, interesting things on the final stretch. If you look at holes 13 through 17, you see there was an average of a 45% birdie rate. 29 Eagles were carded on hole 14 and <laughs> Waden sides four strokes to play hole 15, three times mind blown. Um, but it gave every player a chance to call back with four or five birdies. They knew were available at the end of their round. And we saw that there were five or six players who were in the hunt, but the closing stretch wasn't without danger, which is the best part here because holes 14, 15, 17, and 18, they were responsible for 61% of all OB strokes for the entire weekend. And hole 18 had a 35 to 40% bogey or worse rate on average each round with four possible winners coming into hole 18. I think hole 18 did its job this year, but it risked a very boring finish because what if Barella was up by one or two? Nobody wants to see a layup drive for the win, just like Sam said. And Borella and Heimberg, even in an interview about the course, said that that's a problem that can't happen. Personally, final holes for me have to be par fours, allowing for safe and aggressive shots. Nothing should be decided off the tee, like Sam said. It requires more of players to finish around. I prefer the original hole 18. Give me the new layout at hole 18 at the end. We're good. Okay, so kind of an agreement there. Uh, Hunter, are you on the same page? I am. Yeah, it's unfortunate that I'm going third here because I don't really know what else to add, but I'm a try. So I like how it ended up playing, as everyone said, um, but that was about the best it could have played out realistically. Um, at, at the end of the day, I think par threes just aren't ideal for the final hole of the event. Um, my reasoning is more so viewership because it just doesn't let the drama build enough. Once the tee shots land, like in this case, once Calvin's tee shot landed, was there a scenario where it could have still went to a playoff and stuff? Sure, absolutely. Highly unlikely, though. And so you kind of felt the moment deflate. Like it got there, everyone threw their tee shot, done. 
sick. Okay, everything had just built up for 18 holes is over in just a, an instant. Uh, the par four and five allows the story to build, allows that moment to build, allows the tension to build, which is what you want as a storyteller, which is what you want during a broadcast, which is what you want when you're trying to keep viewers engaged. Um, and so obviously you can't write the story in sports, but you can try your best. And course design is one of those ways you can really affect how the story plays out. And I think a par four or five is what really allows that tension to build in the mm -hmm. moment that you possibly have the most. Cause like a par five, there could realistically be three stroke swings. There wasn't going to be a three stroke swing on that hole ever. Um, so someone could go up by two and lose it all on hole 18 still, which keeps the viewer engaged all the way through. And then you're also sitting there even several holes before going, well, hole 18's coming. So I think four or five is where it needs to go. Yeah, sometimes just having that idea that a lot of strokes could be won or lost on a hole is is important. Um, Brody, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think my I've said this many times. A par three is is a pretty lame way to finish a tournament. I think it's also a cop out a lot of times because um, you only have to execute one shot, and uh, when you have the lead, only being able, only having to do that, it's really a lot. It's a lot nicer. You also don't have to really make a decision at all right? Like AB didn't really have a decision to be made on that final hole. Uh, ben Calloway did, I guess you could say Ben did. He could have, he said he could have played for par and, and forced the issue with the other guys behind him with a one shot lead. But I, I think the par five actually would have been a much better finishing hole, uh, which is actually right next to that one. So you would have that same gallery, I guess. And Gary kind of nailed it. The idea of why this became hole 18 was not because, oh, this is a good hole to finish on. The idea was, well, our whole or old hole 18 like sucks for spectators. That's not a good answer to switch. And then I'll push back a little bit. I think hole 17, Gary was saying it was, he likes the risk reward there. I think in that instance, having the OB around the basket kind of sucks. If you look at like Ben Calloway's shot, um, he would have been OB by quite a bit and had a long putt and probably would have missed anyways and made par. He would have gotten the same score. I think when you have OB around the basket like that, you can be pretty aggressive because you know, even if you go OB, you're still going to have a putt for par. Yeah. A lot of times the OB can be so weird in disc golf. A lot of times it acts as like a safety net when Correct. realistically it's meant to punish the player when they, it's like, it's that, that, that give and take of like, Oh, it's close to the basket. So you gotta, you have a tight green, but also if you're throwing long approach shots, you could just nuke it knowing that the worst. I have, yeah. Yeah. You're, you're not wrong. Um, definitely would make things difficult there. Um, all right. We are going to move on now. Talk about Calvin Heimberg. Uh, that's definitely kind of been a recurring topic, but it's now almost coming up on a calendar year here. So it's been nearly a calendar year since Calvin Heimberg won on tour la um, at last year's Jonesboro open, obviously took place a little later in the season uh, last year is now the time to start the narrative that he has forgotten how to win, or is he exempt from that label considering his consistent podium finishes? Curious to hear what you guys have to say about this. Gary, what are your thoughts? I think it's ludicrous to say that Calvin's forgotten how to win. If that were the case, why is he given the opportunity to win so many times? I think the better question might be, why is he not winning right now? And I think that's because the field has grown beyond allowing mistakes to be made in big ways. I mean, the double bogey he took on hole 10 in the final round of Jonesboro, that was shocking to me because when I think of Jonesboro, I think of Calvin slicing and dicing that fairway every single time. The last three years on that hole, he's had seven birdies and four pars. He hasn't even sniffed a bogey yet alone a double bogey. But I think his biggest regret might be on hole 16 where he put himself in a decent position to get a birdie. He just needed a little chip forehand. And he said in the interview that down the stretch, if he needed to, he might throw one. The biggest thing for me is he watched Simon throw moments before him to go over the top and Simon went out of bounds. And he decided to follow that line anyway and he found himself in a position where the par was really tough to or the birdie was tough to get and he took par um you don't get to take rounds off anymore and i think calvin's figuring that out if you look at the open at austin in the first round three players outscored calvin in the third round two players outscored calvin but guess what second round 29 players outscored calvin at texas states first same thing first round one player outscored calvin third round five players outscored calvin but in the second round 22 players outscored calvin the field is not tolerating bad rounds anymore I think Calvin's a threat to win every single weekend that he plays and gets on the tee pad. And I think he's capable of winning multiple events this year. And I think he's going to, I just think right now he needs to try to find a way to keep it more clean through the entire event, especially these three rounders where he doesn't have the extra round of clawback. 
Yeah, interesting is that they're kind of falling asleep almost was, in that in that middle round there. Was he OB on 16? Did they make that OB behind the back? Because he made his putt. I don't... On 16. Mm, no, he decided to go... So. He, he came up, he decided to go over the top, and he landed like in the bushes off to the left. I know, but then he made that putt. No, he missed that putt short. Oh, he hit it in the cage? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, that yeah, was he, took, he took the par when he could have yeah, just... Okay, okay. okay. I, yeah. think, I think initially they were thinking that was OB, and maybe that's where I got confused. Mm -hmm. the yeah, because Simon went OB on this almost the same line. He went line. left. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right, Hunter, do you agree? Uh, yeah, so I think the thing to remember right now, if we're talking Calvin like today, is as Gary alluded to, he still doesn't have his forehand back. So he's just not a complete player out there right now. And the performance he's able to put up out there without one of the assets to his game is pretty remarkable. Um, it's unfortunate because I do think that this early stretch we're, we're playing in is his best chance to win all year. But as we saw last year, he can get in contention anywhere. Now, what I think the key difference is, is last year we saw a lot of turn-ins where he would get in contention and we saw some just like, what are you doing moments. Um, this year, it feels like the mistakes aren't like that. Like some of, we literally saw some like 15 foot putts missed under pressure last year which was like okay this guy's forgotten how to win i don't think we're seeing that this year um so i don't think this narrative really holds weight because i think that he's putting himself still in a position to win while injured which is impressive um that he's able to do so and i think once his game's fully back then maybe we can talk as it goes on i think the narrative does hold weight for majors because that's something he hasn't done yet but with so many elite series wins under his belt i don't think that's something that's on his mind right now i think right now it's just getting back healthy and i think he's probably even surprised that he's still rattling off top fives like it's his job um with only that one blip being chess.com so the wins will come at the elite series can he make it happen at a major that's still tbd okay hunter not ready to pull the trigger on that narrative yet either um brody are you yeah well i mean hunter was beating around the bush let's just say what it is calvin's worse guys calvin is worse he is a worse player than he was a couple months ago and we have to deal with that true you know well, he's injured so no well, no he's worse makes though, sense yeah. but he's worse um no let's be let's be real here <laughs> again kind of going back to my point you have so many things have to go your way to win on tour. It's no longer, Hey, if I just go out there and I play well, I can win a B open the door with poor play in that front nine to allow someone else to win. Even though he played incredibly well, if Ben Callaway doesn't miss that seven footer, if Ben Callaway doesn't miss that 15 footer, if Ben Callaway doesn't go OB on 18, Ben Callaway wins by multiple strokes this tournament. The, the tournament was for Ben Callaway. Also, you look at Ezra. Ezra doesn't run that stupid putt, which this is after tour life. I'm going to hound him on why the heck he ran that putt. Uh, also, why the heck is Ezra trying to throw a 350 foot straddle forehand over water on the par five? Like if Ezra doesn't do those two moves, Ezra wins the tournament. A lot of stuff had to happen and AB had to go six under through five holes, that five hole stretch to win. It's you know, Sam's going to come on here and say it's actually not that hard to win on tour. But I'll tell you, it's hard to win on tour, folks. And uh, Calvin just, unfortunately, he's like the Dan Marino right now. Are we going to say Dan Marino was trash? I mean, I, no, I didn't say Calvin was trash either. Well, did, did Dan uh, Marino not know how to win? Or did the chips just not fall his way? That's, uh, that's, all, that's all I'm saying. People were, people would say it maybe, um, but he also played a team sport. So that's a little different. Uh, Sam, what are your thoughts? Um, as I'm going to come in with a hot take here. I think maybe Please. Calvin has forgotten how to win. Um, <laughs> and, and I looked back at it yesterday. Um, and I think that maybe uh, when you look at it, it might be Parker Welk's fault. Parker Welk Please. was the last be, before this weekend. Parker Welk was the last person to beat Calvin Heimberg and at a tour event by a single stroke. Parker Welk went down the stretch and went shot for shot with Calvin and ended up beating him. And since then, Calvin has not come in second and only lost by a single stroke. He's put himself in it, it, at the top of these tournaments. Right. But he hasn't been that close to the leader when it really comes down to it. 
He, is he playing great disc golf? Absolutely. Calvin Heimberg probably has the highest floor out of any disc golfer on tour, right? His floor is probably better than anybody else's, but I'm starting to think that his ceiling might not be much higher than his floor, right? I think that Parker Welk might have shaken his confidence, which is causing Calvin to make these mistakes down the stretch, right? That double bogey this last weekend that took him out of it. He fought back. He has that floor and, and he's a great disc golfer. He was able to fight back and put himself one stroke away from winning this tournament, but it wasn't enough because his confidence isn't there. He might have actually just forgotten how to win a little bit. Listen, I actually really wait, like you, the, wait, hold I really on. the floor. Hold on. Did he just contradict himself by saying like Calvin hasn't gotten close to winning and then just ended it by saying he almost won as close as that, that event he mentioned. He this is the been... first event since he lost DDO to Parker Welk. That you're he's saying been he had one stroke. You're of saying a he... win. That's a statement. Okay, but he was, I mean, he was two shots away from winning and Nicholas played absolutely out of his mind at the end to, to win um, the Doesn't Nicholas. Make a statement a lie. No, I know, That's but it, it, yeah. stats, you can throw a lot of stats out. We all know this, Trevor. You can throw a lot of stats out there to make it seem like your point, but it's not accurate. Like that's not, that's not saying Calvin hasn't been close to winning is insane. He has been close to winning. Multiple, I've never multiple said times. he hasn't been close, close to winning. He didn't, he said he hasn't been as close. I think, I think you're pulling things out of the air and inferring right, some things fam. that I haven't been all said. Right, all I mean, right, you can't fam. take his argument and pick it apart when he didn't say a lie. Like, I mean, he did, he said he hasn't been as close as that tournament. That's completely correct. He didn't. With one, he, sure, sure. If we're going to say one shot, he hasn't been as close. But that that the that notion is exactly say, what I said. Great, Sam. <laughs> but the the idea that one shot there is uh, okay. Continue on. He was just picking a narrative. <laughs> Listen, point of the show. I, exactly. I, he was picking a narrative, and I'm saying his narrative is wrong. Calvin's been super close to winning fair. multiple, multiple that's times. Fair. Listen, it's fair to say that like he was trying to make it seem like Calvin hasn't been this close in forever. And it's no, like, that's no, fair point. it's fair. It's fair to say yeah. that. Yes. Even though that he hasn't been that close, he still is in it to win all the time. That is completely fair. And what I will say though, Sam is I do like your floor ceiling point. I never really thought about it that way, but I think you may be right in, like how often do we look back at a tournament and be like, Oh my gosh, Calvin went ballistic. And it's that much different than when he just plays his normal game, which is really good. Yeah. Um, it may just be that his, his floor is like fifth place and his ceiling a lot of times is like third. And that's just where it ends up. Well, I disagree. Um, he doesn't have the highest floor. Who do you think has a higher floor? A B. Well, this season that you could argue that well, no, yeah. no, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about this year, Trevor. He has the highest floor. I'm talking about the facts here. Aren't we? See how well, stupid my that argument is, went into See last year, so I was is, taking Trevor? last year. Maybe the greatest start to start. You're the only one yelling, Brody. You're the only oh, one yelling. Right I'll now. yell all day. I don't care. I know you. you don't in the chat. All the people that don't like yelling. <laughs> Just peak entertainment. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I'm Come excited. On, Gary. I like, I like Come getting on, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I agree with a little bit of column A and a little bit of column B, and you know what? <laughs> Gary, I, I yield my floor to watch Sam Gary's and Brody just fight it and out. Just, uh, slowly make his way to the championship. <laughs> good, very good. I wish this is where I, this episode. I wish Dust. I wish Dustin was here, man, to just just get. Oh my god! Get so riled up right Dustin now. Gets fired every, time, up. every time I see Brody get excited, I just live whisper in his ear, "Do it." <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny too because there's some people in the comments that are like, "Wow, Brody was like really bullying. He's like super mean." It's like. They understand that this is like a show. Like I'm not arguing with me all day. Please, Sam and Brody are please. roommates, guys. Yeah. <laughs> I've, had people, I've had people ask me afterwards, like, is he nice afterwards? <laughs> yeah. It's, it's a, <laughs> I, I, I just don't think some people don't like uh, arguments. Yeah. But it's well, fine. It's well, arguments maybe don't about, arguments maybe don't about sports. Night. Yeah, yeah, maybe yeah, don't watch debate sports. night. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. We, we got, got one more thing. Me to... and Hunter were on debate night. That That's the show that you want to see. Yeah, there are arguments there. there. We, we tried our podcast. hardest. Yeah. Um, <laughs> all right. We got one more topic to argue about. Uh, I don't know if anybody will have an argument for this. I'd, I'd love to hear it. But uh, so Maple Hill, they made a splash in the disc golf community recently when a picture of their new triple Mando was leaked online. Do you think the Mando looks good? Do you think it will add to the whole? And are you a fan of artificial obstacles in general, Hunter? Yeah, well, let's start here. Okay, does the structure that make up the Mando look good? Yes. Would I love them to finish it out, put it in my backyard, and I can put my leaf blower in it? Yes. <laughs> does it fit on one of the most naturally beautiful disc golf courses in the world? No, not even close. It's awful. And it's on the first hole, too. So it's like, welcome to Maple Hill. Can't wait for you to see the clown nose on 18. Like, what are we doing out here? This was like one of the most jaw dropping things I've ever seen. Uh, if we want to artificially make courses harder, I'm for it. 
I'm golden. I'm here, okay? But it's got to fit the vibe of the course. We talked about this with USDGC, okay? USDGC already has this gimmicky vibe to it, so more gimmicks tend to fit in a little bit better. Do I agree with all of them? No, I hated the mozzarella sticks. I'm still not that big of a fan of them. They put freaking Christmas trees two inches from a tea pad. That wasn't the best idea, mm -hmm. but that fits a lot better than Maple. You know what? Maybe the Christmas trees actually would fit better at Maple Hill. Maybe I take that one back. Maybe they would fit better there. But this is just a barn. I understand they're trying to go for like a covered bridge type thing, Massachusetts, whatever. Hoorah. Let's burn it. Let's not do it. Okay, don't actually burn it. Sorry. Let's not. <laughs> let's just, let's just someone, get this off the course. someone get this off the course is what I mean to say we don't want it out there it's going to be an eyesore luckily this was kind of posted and leaked we're in april right now uh let's get it gone by september we got plenty of time to do so okay gone by september is that hashtag gone by september is that is that where you're going to get started yeah no please Imagine, don't burn it you're no one start a, start a unless you're the owner movement. of the property and you want to take it somewhere safe that's fine i just had to clear that one up Didn't okay. it, that came out that came um, out wrong brody are you nearly as passionate about it well, I'll say that if, if, if the right people, if the right professional disc golfers say something, it will not be there. I'll say that. Um, cool. I mean, it is what it is. Uh, does it, does it look like it fits? No, but it was funny how Hunter was like super like adamant of like, this is the most naturally beautiful course. Cause like Yuli hates this course. He thinks it looks terrible because every fairway has a, a road down it, which if you actually start thinking about it, He's kind of right. Like every, every fairway does kind of have like a road. So it's not like naturally beautiful in the sense of where there isn't, uh, I mean, there's roads you're, you're throwing your fairways are roads. So Yuli does have a point there, but I'm going to, I think we all agree. It looks weird, but does it serve a purpose? And I believe it does because the trees on the right have been thinning out the last several years. And what that ends up happening is one, you get shots that people are trying to throw through the gap that's intended and they go through the right side, which is not intended and they get lucky and they get birdies. That's not good for disc golf. And then also what ends up happening is if you throw a bad tee shot and you throw your, you know, everyone throws that landing zone shot and laying up. If you get too far to the right, we're all trying to throw it in the gap there, but if you get too far on the right, you can still just jump putt through those trees and you can do the same exact thing. So this change is actually going to make it good because a good drive also, it's going to, um, force people to try to get a little bit more aggressive off the tee to get more distance so they can actually try to get the birdie. I think it's a good change. Looks terrible. Okay. Okay. Brody respecting the functionality of yes. the obstacle. Okay. Very, unless very, you can build a tree, like unless you can grow a tree like that. <laughs> True. All right, Sam, what do you think of the new obstacle? The <laughs> okay. Uh, I think I'm about to go four for four here. I'm disagreeing with Brody again. Oh no. <laughs> uh, I, I don't like the execution of the Mando. I think it looks silly. It's out of place. I think, I think artificial Mandos can be, we agree there. Can, can be done. Yes. Yes. I'm, I'm not there yet. Um, I, I, I think that they can be done well and it just hasn't been done well in this, um, situation. I, I think it just kind of sticks out and it really, it, it ruins whole one. Um, where I disagree is that I don't think it makes the hole better. I, I don't, ag I don't agree that it improves the play of the hole. I think people are going to throw their bomb drive over out over the lake into the open or not so open field, depending on the growth of the trees. Um, and then this triple Mando is just going to make people lay up. Um, yes. uh, like the hole already averaged over par last year through, through, throughout the MVP tournament. Um, why, why are we trying to make it harder? It's already one of the top like six hardest holes. It's in the hardest third of the course without the triple Mando. Sure. Some people are getting lucky over on the right hand side, being able to pitch through the thinning trees, but a triple Mando here is just going to promote people laying up to it and then tossing through and taking their par and going home. I think, I think it takes away some of the excitement and some of the fun of, you know what? I do have a line through these trees. Let me throw this half scramble shot to get onto the green um, and it's just going to cause people to lay up. Uh, I think it ruins the whole. Okay. Valid points, valid points. Gary, what are your thoughts? Well, when I first saw the post, I thought I had missed another April fool's post. I, I was yeah. like, Oh, I had double take on this one. And honestly, no disrespect to Steve Dodge. I think the guy's a legend in the sport and probably one of the most genuine people I've met, but I think this is a, a clear miss. I think it's a classic case of having something that's good and way too much time on your hands. And you just need to know <laughs> when to stop. Uh, a hole one at Abel Hill is like one of the most iconic hole ones for so many disc golf fans around the world. I remember my first time there. It's like stepping into a new world. Um, but I think it detracts from the hole quite a bit because 
there's no um you know epic out of position shots uh i think you're gonna see too many layups i think the gap already creates the ideal airspace to throw in maybe just a couple of mando uh, arrows to make go between that would be better plant christmas trees on the side where the thinning trees are at that'd be cool and stick with the theme of the course um, but I, and I also think if the goal is to create scoring separation, it's probably not going to actually do that because instead of scoring ranges from three to six, you're going to see a lot of smart pars. And it's just people who are going to be laying up, getting their fours and moving on with an occasional five and a miraculous three. I've also seen, you know, the comments about the risk reward scenario going through the trees. I understand if it was huge there, every player was doing it, but they're not yet. So let's wait and see what happens. Artificial obstacles. I'm not a fan. Um, I don't think it's the way to do things. And I think there's a reason why everyone talks about mini golf when they see that kind of stuff. Disc golf is widely appreciated to be a natural, you know, outdoor activity. And I think someday there may be a way to incorporate them, but it's not today. Okay. Yeah, you, Brady, what are your thoughts yeah, on rebuttals, rebuttals, I, rebuttals, I kind rebuttals. of, I kind of like their point on like, we don't it, have money. You may see more fours, yeah. like just like layups. First off, this whole natural thing, d- golf is a natural sport. It's the least natural thing. If you actually see a golf course be p- before, it's a bunch of dirt. Mm-hmm. So this whole idea that this is natural. No, that's a bunch of bogus. I think what people we don't, mean when they say natural is they just want I, like it, things yes. that will be in the environment, I guess. Yeah, but you could go out into a, a patch of woods and you go, man, I could just see a disc golf line here. You could throw a disc through the trees. You're not going into an open field and going, man, if I just dig all this out and put a golf green here and a bunker there and a bunker I mean, there. You're still cutting down trees. So it's, it's, it is a, it is like a whatever, but I think, uh, the hunter's point, if they would have had the, um, the thing that they had on hole one at USWDGC, I think Hunter would have liked that. Did you guys watch that tournament? Yeah, the yeah. like Sprinkle Valley. The nice triple va- the triple yeah. mando there. If they had something like that and it said Maple Hill, I think people yeah. would be less worried. Um, but yes, to go to your point, Hunter about or Trevor about the play. Has anyone played that hole? Gary. Me. Okay, me and Gary have played it. Great. Okay. So um the the idea that more people are going to lay up, a, a lot of people already lay up on that hole. But now, it, it, well, let me ask Sam because I, I don't want to misconstrue his point. What, what is wrong with people laying up on that hole now? Like, what, what was your point? We're saying you're like, you're saying there'd be less aggressive shots. You're yeah, saying there's, there's, there's more layups. It's right? the score separation. Yeah, it's, it's everybody's going to be taking a four. Okay. I disagree. There's going to be more scoring separation now because now your layup actually has to be accurate. If you're in the Christmas trees, you can't just chuck a shot that people were chucking. And then, like I said, again, I don't know if people are listening to me. If you throw your shot too far to the right there, it would be almost impossible to get up and down through that triple Mando. But in the old hole, you can jump putt and make birdie. People were jump putting and making birdie through the trees. So this idea that the course would play, it's, it's no, you actually have to land it in a really small spot. And sometimes like you guys were saying, People get in those weird Christmas trees and it's going to be very difficult. And now you also like, if you're 250 feet, 300 feet away, that shot is now difficult. So a lot of times people would like punch out and uh, be able to just chip up and get a par. That's you actually have to, the scoring separate is going to be better. Hunter, Gary, what are our thoughts Uh, here? I just, I had a question for, because Brody, you keep talking about like, uh, how you need to be able to like, you're talking more left to right. Why does it have to be a triple Mando? I, I think it's simply because, like, what were they going to do? Just plant two posts? Well, like, like Gary had mentioned, you just make those two trees that are already there the double Mando. The trees are do pretty, the trees are pretty wide. But I'm just saying that force it, it eliminates the problem you're talking about of going through to the right. Like, it solves that problem if that's the problem to yeah, solve. I mean, yeah. If you want to do if if you want to do the two Mandos, that's fine. No one brought that point up. But if you want to do did. it, Gary did. Gary Bear. You said you wanted to have the two mandos on the tree. Yeah, you, I said you, you could, could do that, do that. Or, or you could even plant Christmas trees that are themed with the course along yeah, the yeah, side yeah, of the tree farm. If you do, if you do the Christmas trees, I could see that. Um, yeah, I think there would be less less pushback. But I think I think we can that, all agree if it was done tastefully, we nobody would be talking about it at all. We just yeah, like, if it didn't look like a barn. But, it probably wouldn't even get posted on Twitter. Listen, guys, you do something crazy like this, we're gonna find a reason to talk about it on these podcasts. I promise you. <laughs> but how it's gonna pl- how it's gonna play? It's gonna play better. People that throw better tee shots are going are going to have a better, uh, an easier time of birding or parring. How many, how, yeah, many sorry, play, how many players who are going to be a little too far to the right or a little too far to the left would go for that gap 
now compared to going for that gap if that triple That's mando the is there wait wait like, say, yeah. it again, say it again like, sorry so let's take take uh take every player on the tour and put them yeah. too far to the left or too far to the right on their tee shot okay. but not that far how many okay. of them are going to go for the gap as it existed before where you have the a greater airspace trying to skip something in there versus how many mm-hmm. are going to go to try to go through this you know well, but, that's, but that's my point too, is like now if they aren't going to go for it now, their second shot, there's pressure on that second shot to land in the spot. Because if you are a little, that's a very Gary, it's a very tight left to right spot. Yeah, so if you're, if you're off just a little bit to the right, like if you're five feet right of the Mando, that, that might be nearly impossible to get inside of the circle. Is it's anybody possible. thinking about pace of play though? All these, who, all these. Oh, who's, gonna, who's gonna get here the first? Go. Who's gonna get the first barn ricochet birdie? That's what I want to know. Ooh, mm. I'm looking a, up the photo. They should right put a cowbell on it that you yeah. ring when you go through it. That'd be fun. What else? You know? Yeah, Maybe they a definitely crow in there. I was incorrect. They definitely could have um, these trees right here. They definitely could have put two mandos. Yeah. That was the thing I saw. And it goes to my birdies, or was it Gary that said you've got they got too much time on their hands and like don't like yeah. that's probably yeah. what it was. It's like, well, we could just put arrows on these trees, or yeah, I, a barn. But <laughs> it also, guys, it also looks like the right side has thinned out even more since last year. Like Maybe I'm looking did. at Maybe it, this was like a this might have like, been just like an emergency decision. It looks like there's yeah. two trees there now. It's I it's mean, emergency way decision thinner than six I thought. Months out so, from the event, yeah. I'd look. Yeah, Ain't I'd love to know what, man. why not do the mandos and 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 put that there. I'd love. That's love, what I was curious. Yeah, yeah. I think a double like mando it. fixes the problem. I, I think I think it would provide more scoring separation if it was a double mando versus a triple mando. The triple mando is. If the scoring separation is if, if the scoring separation is not better this year than last year, I'll give you twenty dollars. Ooh, there you go. go. I, I'll pay uh, Steve Dodge money to go volunteer to ask him that question this year. Excellent. Thank there you. you. Go. <laughs> All righty. Well, we're going to move on to our finals now. Hunter, Gary, all tied up, moving on to the finals. Get rid of the, those two, uh, two guys that just kept bickering, you know. Uh, this is a pretty juicy one. All tied up. we got a, a very juicy topic here, something that was just announced. Um, Gary, you're, our, you're, I think you're our most recent champion, so I'll let you decide if you want to go first or second. I relinquish my time to Hunter for first. Okay. Hunter will go first. This is the question. The Disc Golf Pro Tour just announced a partnership with U.S. Integrity, a move that brings them closer to the sports wagering market. This is being met with some very strong opinions in various ways, especially online. Uh, how do you think sports betting will impact our game? What are some potential some potential strengths and weaknesses of this movement? Hunter. So we got to look at this thing objectively first, okay? We got to take what it is out of it and just look at it because let's sit, let's take two points first. Will it bring more eyeballs to the sport? Yes. Will it bring more money to the sport? Yes. If you remove that it's gambling from this, I think everyone would agree both of those things are good. Where it gets tricky is I don't think anyone has to be told gambling has the capability to destroy lives. So the growth of the sport is good, but this decision does come at a cost. Um, so like, let's look at me personally, right? I personally, I don't have temptation to overdo it on gambling. That's not something I've ever struggled with. I think it's a ton of fun to throw $5 on a team at a major sporting event and it increased my interest in the game. That's sick. I lose every time the house makes five bucks off me win, win scenario. That's not the case for everyone though. And I think that's a, the pro tour has to think about this as they move forward. And I think that's where you're seeing two different op, uh, the opposing sides. I think it's definitely going to be polarizing, um, but it's also a line of like, it was eventually going to happen. What I'm very interested in is this has now happened in the season that we've seen the disappearance of prize picks, which makes me wonder, did the pro tour find out that legally they have rights to some type of information that was being used by prize picks to make these lines and they were missing out on money. And that's how we've gotten here. Or is the pro tour just like, Hey, someone's going to do it might as well be us um but they're gonna get a lot of pushback it's just a question of like is the pro tour willing to go because in the end it will grow the sport it will give content creators more talking points and interesting stats it will make the game a lot more fun for a lot more people and it will bring in more eyeballs with more intense focus but at what cost and is it all worth it that's for the pro tour to decide okay okay Uh, hunter a fan of some of the bonuses potentially, but also leery of what the consequences could be. Gary, what are your thoughts on this whole sports betting situation? 
I, I agree 100 percent that it's going to add more eyes to the sport and it's going to inject more money into it that's a no-brainer the gambling thing is the hard part here um sports betting is exploding you know last year you look 120 billion dollars spent in, in in bets and the ads are pretty much everywhere there are some legitimate concerns for disc golf uh one of them being is how close players are to the outcomes of those bets um you know while i'd like to think that players wouldn't do anything they're all human i mean it happens on the large stage look at last year with the uh, the five football players at iowa and the alabama baseball coach uh betting against and for their own team that's where i think the partnership with us integrity is a really great move i did a lot of looking into their site they're very interesting stuff they have a lot of great youtube content too but um you know they're watchdogs of the betting systems across the board they work with people like FanDuel, DraftKings, BetMGM, and a lot of the other big um, sports organizations. And I like this because the DGPT is basically coming out and saying, if we're going to do this, we're going to try to do this right. Um, another big concern obviously is how the lines are going to be created. Like Hunter said, you know, with prize picks, uh, a lot of people ran prize picks through the cleaners uh, when that came out because they didn't understand how to do their lines. They had to shut down their disc golf book. So some serious work needs to be done to make sure to get that right. And maybe they could learn a little something from uh, cool bet, which is an interesting betting platform over in Europe. Um, that that deals with disc golf. So what are they doing and uh, what are they doing correctly? One of the biggest negatives, obviously, is the perception of gambling. Like Hunter said, you know, are we contributing to an addiction? I think that's where another lesson can be learned by looking over to Europe, um, where this is a, has better reception. You know, Kristen Tatar is sponsored by PAF. They give their proceeds to the public via grants, and it was estimated that you know they gave out 15 million euros in 2020 in public grants for like sustainability and whatnot. So I think their transparency really helps with like the overall community perception of of betting. I think ultimately, at the end of the day, it's something that's going to happen, but it needs to be done slow, calculated, and just be transparent with the public. Gary, 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 you know I can never turn down those blue eyes. I'm going to have to be the win today. Um, Good points. Good points from both you guys. Uh, oh, he racked me on that last one. Good research, yeah, that was, Gary. Very good yeah, research. Yeah, very very good. I will say, um, <sighs> disc golf betting, I think when it comes to the sports betting world, people's opinions are pretty set in stone. It can be like politics a lot of times where people are either going to love it or they're going to hate it. But I think the benefits are there. And I think the pro tour, the way that they move within the disc golf industry is always very carefully. So I'm sure that they're going to be treating this with the utmost care because this is this could be a boycott level event if the right people got mad enough at the situation. So I'm sure that they are going to do it in a careful way. Um, but I'm excited about it. Like, sorry. I, I mean, you don't think I'm going to put in a parlay every single weekend and then losing when mm -hmm. some guy, when some guy rolls away from the basket, 60 feet. Um, it'll be interesting to see, but I could, uh, I could definitely see the scandals arising. A lot of people were, were mentioning that whole idea of like, we have, you, you know, Gary, you said it, we have these betting scandals that are happening in the NBA. We just had one. Um, it was Michael Porter Jr.'s brother from the, from the Raptors who like, he might be getting banned for life from the league for, for betting on games. And you're, you're seeing clips of him like potentially missing three pointers on purpose and stuff like that. Well, the thing it's too, old, the thing, the, sorry, go ahead. No, it's, that's all I was just saying. Oh, I was going to say the thing too is like, you know, Portnoy, for example, just had a crazy stretch where he ended up actually winning more money than the third place guy at the masters. Right. But he had to bet an insane amount disc golf. You, you don't, don't have, have to, to you, don't, you don't nope. have to bet that much to make more than the winner. Let me mm -hmm. tell you when the price thing, <laughs> when the price stick thing was going on and their lines were crummy, I I didn't dominate the way some people did because I'm just that oh, bad. How about the players though, Trevor? Yeah, no, no, yeah, but I'm, I'm saying, saying like, like I, I can bet five thousand dollars yeah, and no, the, like make more than the winner. Yeah, no, I'm tournament. just saying some of the guys I knew that did prize picks, their payouts were so good yeah. that like if you were a player in control of that, forget mm -hmm. about it. Like it's the temptation will definitely be there and i'm sure that is going to be some like there there's no way if disc golf betting exists i would say this with a guarantee there is no way we make it through five seasons without somebody getting banned for life for game well i mean no think way. of how think of how often even on the pro tour a like 20 footers missed like our sports oh too yeah it's gonna be so right. easy oh to yeah path. Yeah, Are one of the me? one of the lines I wrote down from a Reddit comment was, "You can make way more money throwing around um, than you can losing to Anthony Barella," and I thought that was really funny. That's, <laughs> yeah. that's so true. You can make so much more money throwing rounds. That is right now. Well, Gary, you're the champion today, um, multiple time winner now. Uh, what do you have to say about your your victory today? 
just, I just think it's great being out here talking about disc golf, you know, a little home game for all of you out there who say that, uh, this is super easy and that you should do this with no notes or you should do this with all the notes, play a little game at home next time, pause the video after he asks the question and see what you can do for 90 seconds. And then uh, oh, listen to the Gary, rest of it. Get him, Gary. Get him, Gary. It's not as easy as it looks to come out here and do this. So listen, t- hey, you're, you're 100 percent right. I listen. We have had a lot of different people on this show. What, what these guys do is not easy. It really isn't. Getting on air and being on live, basically, and then talking for 90 seconds about these topics, not super easy to do. So if you're in the comments and you think you're hot stuff, hey. Hey, Should we got. Message, we got to get that guy on Twitter. We got to get that guy on okay, Twitter. Bro, that guy's never. He's yeah. never. And there's going there's the other that. side of it too. Like if you're a big fan of the pro tour, it's even harder when you're sitting here and like Brody's the one talking you down because it's a it's a professional that you know and you watch and you like. And yeah, so, but and, I'm I'm wrong seventy five percent. Yeah, I know, but you're you're. What I like about you is you're, passionate, like, you're passionate. You're passionate. I didn't, about feel, I didn't feel like I was he's, like he's one scary. Of those, he's those scary. Panic people where like yeah. Sam had a life jacket. And I didn't, and I was like jumping on Sam <laughs> the entire episode. And I, I, I we both drowned. I think this is what is like that. Yeah, bro, if you oh, were a smoothie, you'd be half passion that, fruit, Sam. half dragon fruit. You're fine. Um, all There's right. a fun one, though. I like much- these. To me, these are so much better than everyone being like, yeah, I, I agree. Exactly. Yeah, right. Hey, we live, we live to yell at each other about sports. Uh, QR code here on the screen, throw it up here. Uh, this is where you can submit topics. Some weeks like this week, I didn't even need a submission because there were so many interesting things to talk about. Um, but most weeks I do. And if you scan this or click the link in the description, you can submit your topics and I will take a look at every single one of them. I will pick some of them occasionally to throw on the show. Brody. Also, Chris and Tatar dominated. Uh, I know we might have some people coming at us because we didn't have any FPO topics. Get over it. There was nothing to talk about. She destroyed everyone. <laughs> so deal with it. She did. She's the best. Hey, we talked about it on Grip Block. Make sure to check that podcast out. It also rocks. And we will see you next, uh, next Wednesday. I got to remember to talk in future tense uh, with another episode.